welcome everybody to this budget submission. Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, um, the first Australians, and recognise that they have a unique relationship with the land and the water. Council further recognises that we are situated on the land of the traditional owners, the Bunurong and the Boonurong members of the Kulin Nation, who have lived here for thousands of years. We offer our respects to their elders, past and present, and through them, all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, wherever they are. So thank you, everybody, uh, for being patient and getting online. Um, what we'll do is um, please note that uh, this is not a formal council meeting and therefore will not be, um, there are no um, decision-making requirements or motions that can be moved or seconded. Uh, the hearing provides councillors with uh, the opportunity to listen to submitters. It is not an engagement session. Whilst councillors may ask for clarification questions of the submitters, uh, this session does not provide for sub the submitter to be asking questions of council. It is a five-minute session for the submitters to present their, um, their submission to the council. Uh, so our first invitee is for... From um, the uh, from Peter Cook, but David uh, Butler is going to speak for the ratepayers and residents of the Rattle Estate. So welcome, David, and uh, you could start. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Lesserve, <coughs> for this opportunity. As you've just noted, I'm here as a proxy for Peter Cook. Uh, he has a conflicting appointment today, and sends his uh, apologies. I, I wish to comment on our letter to the CEO dated the 25th of March, 2021. This letter was signed and supported by every homeowner on our Ruttel estate, 100% support. Now I'm unaware of what particular information has been presented to all councillors, I'm quite clear on our three ward councillors, Mrs Lang and Mrs Tassari and Lark, they've received from us their own copy of this petition. Everyone who signed that letter see our ward councillors as their representatives in this matter. Specifically, our letter requests an appropriate work plan be established and resourced to undertake a process to resolve the acknowledged conflict within the planning scheme on Ruttle Estate. Now I say acknowledged conflict. We recently became aware of a planning scheme review undertaken by Basco Shire and tabled in May 2018. Now that particular review recommended an investigation and resolution of these planning scheme matters. The point I've just made there is referenced in paragraph two of our letter of the 25th of March. So having discovered that action recommended back in May 2018, and as I say, we only discovered it recently, we then asked why nothing seemingly had been progressed. And as per the opening paragraph of our letter of the 25th of March, 2021, we were informed there is no work plan nor operating budget to undertake such a review. No OPEX expenditure available. Now, in our view, this review needs to be done. And indeed, in terms of the previous report that I referred to back in May 2018, it was acknowledged that it needed to be done. All residents on this estate are impacted by the planning scheme conflict. Our letter of the 25th of March suggests an approach. Let's make it open and transparent. Residents are willing to work with Basco Shire to resolve these matters. These matters have gone on for far too long and Council is the responsible planning authority. 
So I commend our letter of the 25th of March to this meeting for consideration and action. Thank you. Good. Oh, good. Thank you, David. Uh, what um, we will move on to the next one. David's um, session is uh, over. I will. I'll go back one step and and also acknowledge our uh, apologies, which was the mayor, Councillor Tresari, uh, Deputy Mayor, Councillor Whelan, Councillor Lang, and Councillor Rook. So um, I apologise for bringing those in later. Um, thank you to our first submitter. Our second submitter is uh, Bernie Coombs. Um, Bernie, are you there? Uh, if you're not, um, Wayne, I think you probably need to yeah. uh, put your camera off. If you've had your session, please put your um, camera and your, you may stay online, but put your camera and um, microphone off if that's okay. Thanks. Welcome, Bernie. Uh, we'll move on to your submission. And um, yeah, so welcome. Hi Claire, um, so my uh, submission is mostly about climate emergency and the, the backdrop is that the world's in big trouble now with just 1.2 degrees of warming and something that um, I found particularly convincing just recently was the recent ABC TV series, A Year to Change the World, with Greta Thunberg and so love her or hate her, um, the high point was when she addressed the meeting of world business and political leaders at the G20 in Davos and her little voice ringing across an auditorium like that. She quietly explained her frustration beforehand with world media that despite the fact that she presents well-accepted science, um, media insists she's a brat throwing another tantrum about a subject about which she has no knowledge. So she dumbed it down to prevent any misunderstanding, adding what's the point in being in school when politicians refuse to accept facts of science. So world emissions are still increasing. Even conservative IPCC say we're on a path to three to five degrees C. Such projections have always been exceeded. Higher temperatures are expected. The path of RCP 8.5 is followed, which is the past and the Shire report by consultants. How do we feel about this? It's difficult for me to look at our grandchildren in the eye. Um, the simplest explanation of the current climate emergency is that IPCC advised necessary action in 2018 to limit warming to more, no more than 1.5 degrees. Um, yeah, the, it, it is the, the limit to addition of more greenhouse gases to the three kilometre thick transparent blanket in Earth's atmosphere. So the addition is uh, 420 giga or billion tonnes. The world is currently emitting close to 40 gigatons per year. So 420 divided by 40 means that one and a half degrees will be exceeded in 2026. Um, so from agenda of council meeting last week, implementation plan for climate emergency is mentioned, but described as documentation private and internal to um, Basque Coast Shire Council. Uh, the objective is net zero emissions by 2030 with progress should be after five years. Is this realistic with so many stakeholders involved and so many sectors to get anywhere? Surely records need to be kept and presented and reviewed at least every quarter with quite a few quarters elapsed before such a system might be effective. If councillors are representative of ratepayers and others about something that's an existential threat, which is climate change, surely you shouldn't be happy with anything less than a scoreboard prominent on the Shire website showing targets, achievements, whether surplus or de deficit, and updates in subsequent quarters. And so attached to this thing was also a mention of something that's happened in the UK that if um, yeah, town centres are... Um, yeah, suffering um, because of COVID. Um, they did a scheme whereby um, landholders of empty shops can make those shops available to community groups for um, education about climate change um, with an exemption from paying rates. So is, is that something that Bass Coast could consider? Um, so, yeah, I'm not allowed to ask any questions, am I? <laughs> <clears throat> so that's probably the end of that one. And then the second submission um, in the um, agenda for the last council meeting, there's implication that attention should be paid to energy consumption uh, in design of the New Cows Cultural Centre. But um, there's no mention at all of how community as well as Shire 
uh, might reduce energy consumption and emissions to meet expectations of net zero emissions by 2030. So this reflects back on the previous one that, um, yeah, 1.5 degrees is shot by 2026, long before 2030. So, um, yeah, it's a relatively inappropriate target. And so a year's gone by already. So how much reduction has been accomplished from which sectors in this last year and how much for targets for each sector in forthcoming quarters and years? Um, surely this is critical data with it, without which there's no way we will get to the attention destination um, about net zero by 2030. Is it clear how many percentage of reduction per year are needed? Also, how much more difficult it gets if targets aren't met? And so um, if, yeah, if nobody knows, you might consider that it's 10% a year, but that, that's crazy that in the beginning there are there's low hanging fruit and it's easy and then it gets progressively harder as you work through the 10 years. So Bernie, I did a sim. Yep. Five minutes is up. So have you got a final point you'd like to make? Yeah, it, on, on a diminishing balance basis, it's 20% a year. And so I don't think the net zero by 2030 was ever realistic. And I don't think the shy's got a clue right. about how to do it. And right. Thank you. Thank you for your submission. Our next um, speaker will be Wayne Mahoney. Wayne from, is from the Wonthaggy Theatrical Group. Welcome, Wayne. You've got Thank five minutes to give us your submission, points of your submission. Thank Thanks. you, Councillor LeServe, and greetings, everyone, and thank you for your time. Um, an attachment to our submission provides a detailed explanation of WTG's request for $28,490 to purchase 100 <laughs> purpose auditorium chairs. WTG has ordered and paid for 50 chairs. The shed auditorium capacity is 150. <clears throat> that is conceiving on rollout tiered platforms using lockable fit for purpose auditorium chairs. WTG shed at the state coal mine <clears throat> was recently valued at 1.5 million plus. And the annual recurring costs at the shed are in the vicinity of $25,000. So we need to maximise every income generating opportunity available. And without our own seating, WTG is restricted to productions dependent upon the goodwill of other organisations like the Council and New Haven Secondary College. However, the personal connection at New Haven Secondary College no longer exists. And transporting 150 chairs from and to New Haven Secondary College is a laborious exercise and nearly always falls on a few septuagenarians like myself. And the chairs are usually only available during term holidays. WTG currently has use of 88 town hall chairs that are only suitable for flat floor use and could be re recalled at any time. And I thank council and its officers for their cooperation in making the chairs available. In six months to date, there have been four events at the shed and four more are planned in the following six months, but not limited to those four. In its Discover One Thaggy drive, Council identified One Thaggy Theatrical Group as a vital cog in building community connection, capacity and resilience, and expressed a desire to engage more closely with WTG. However, without its own supply of auditorium chairs, WTG's ability to partner with Council and explore further opportunities is severely inhibited. For many years, WTG has sought infrastructure funding through every possible channel to no avail, save $5,000 via Shire Community Grant. Via its Be Seated campaign, WTG has raised $8,000 from community donations. A budget allocation to purchase 100 chairs will complete the final major equipment outlay of what WTG at the shed and allow us to plan future productions confident in the knowledge 
that seating availability is guaranteed. Now, if I were charged with the responsibility of allocating $30,000 to a community organisation, I would want to inspect the premises and see what I'm giving my money to. For any councillors or officers who have not been to WTG Shed at the State Coal Mine and wish to have a tour, please contact me and I will arrange it at any time to suit. I thank you for considering WTG's request and making this time available, and I wish you well in your deliberations. That's me for now. The rest of it's in our submission, but you can read Good. Thank you, Wayne, um, for your uh, submission. Um, I just must reiterate that all councillors have had the opportunity to read all the submissions, so uh, thank you for your presentation, and uh, we'll move on to the next presenter. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Greg Thomas, Thompson, and Jeff Lloyd from Pickle. Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me then? Yes, Jeff. I, oh, yeah, you are, Greg. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what's happened to my visual uh, chair, but I'll um, I'll just press on if I may. Yes. Yep. Thank you very much. Look, we've we've made a detailed submission. Don't propose to go over that again. But I'd just like to start by firstly. Uh, just noting, if I may, to Council that uh, the article in the advertiser this morning doesn't fully reflect the views of the committee. The committee, in fact, met last Thursday. That's the Pickle Committee, and we issued a considered statement, and I've sent that to your Chief Executive as a clear indication of our position. Uh, if I go to the uh, the, the bid uh, uh, chair, um, first of all, thank you for your opportunity to making this bid. I appreciate that uh, funds are scarce. There's a lot of competition. Uh, Pickle's biggest concern, and I'll read this if I may, in the interest of time, but our biggest concern is certainty and keeping up the morale and getting the garden and boomerang bags move happening. So Worley Road, or Worley Avenue rather, is locked in. Uh, we now have the challenge of locking in the move for the garden and our very important boomerang bag operation, both of which are heavily involved with volunteers. Our volunteers give their time uh, but we note that many of them volunteer for self-worth and mental health benefits. Uh, and uh, there is a, a significant amount of stress at the moment amongst our volunteer teams about the level of uncertainty. No one to blame on this. It's just something we have to work through. But I think it's an important factor in getting some certainty around our move and the funding. We've worked very closely with your officers and we have a very harmonious working group uh, happening at the moment on the Blue Cum Reserve move. And we have an agreed timeline that Council uh, has put to us, uh, which sees Council uh, hopefully approving the Blue Gum sighting in August this year and a move in very early 2022. We'd like to go early if possible to maintain morale and not miss the growing season with the garden, uh, at least for the reestablishment of our garden beds. Uh, and one thing we'll be putting forward uh, if we're successful in the budget is to uh, bring forward the move of our garden beds ahead of the rest of the Blue Gum reserve move of our garden. It's said, pleasing to report to Council, we've already been donated a large water tank by the local school. Uh, and this week, the Minister of Reports will announce that the State Government is donating to pickle all of the timber, all of the recycled timber from the Cow's Jetty, which can be used for part of the community garden at Blue Gum Reserve. So the remaining issue is the, is the budget for this move. We've provided Council officers with an extensive amount of material on the design of the garden, uh, elevations, drawings, and our detailed costing, such that making a budget provision as distinct from a final project cost in the next week or two would not be difficult. While our vision over some years built a far more ambitious garden with a major all access program, similarly to some of the ones that have been sponsored by other local governments that we've had a look at in Melbourne, this will support our food relief, deliver good mental health outcomes, and increase our already significant volunteer base. Um, our ask to Council uh, for the budget is a simply a like-for-like like move, that is, picking up our existing gain and moving it across uh, to Blue Gum Reserve, no more, plus a portable for boomerang bags. Now, that is estimated at around 200000 in round terms. We've also proposed in our bid that it would be worth Council considering increasing our access uh, performance, in other words, meeting contemporary uh, access requirements for all accessibility ranges, and this will cost an extra, in around terms, $50,000, making a total budget bid of $250,000. Uh, 
The expansion of this budget provision could happen in two ways. <coughs> council managing the move and obviously spending council's own budget within and people just simply as the beneficiary of that, of that important move or by council providing people with a grant. And a capital could be at the last meeting resolved to support this as an option if it was the way council wished to head and people would then take on the risk of any expenditure above the grant. I'll pass to Greg to give you a bit more detail on the components of the bid, but I'd also like to sincerely thank Council why I've got this moment for the approval of the Worley Avenue Stage 1 building, which is very exciting, and note that Pickle will cover our own moving cost of our contents into the new Worley Avenue building when it's ready, hopefully early in 2022. Uh, thank you. If I may, I pass to Greg if we've still got time. Exactly. 40 seconds remaining. Go. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, councillors, for this opportunity. Uh, if I can just outline that all we're seeking is a very small parcel of land on Blue Gum Reserve, which has been agreed in principle. It's immediately behind the CFA station in Settlement Road. And as Jeff iterated, the the like-for-like like ask that we're seeking is to be able to pick up our, our existing garden infrastructure where we can, where it's suitable for relocation, and put it on a parcel of land measuring no more than 30 metres by 40 metres or 1,200 square metres, which is the current size of our, our existing community garden at Blue I'm Gum. Sorry, at, Greg, uh, can't you a lap? Sorry? I'm sorry, Greg, the five minutes is now up. Okay. Could you be able to... Just wrap up your comment, please. Yes, the um, the timing issue is greatly important to Pickle because a lot of the contracts we execute have very long lead times. And, for example, we thought we would be moving in August this year, which meant we didn't schedule any adult learning for the whole of Phillip Island uh, uh, running out of pickle for term three. We've now got to turn around and renegotiate contracts with the Department of Education. And this is typical of the long lead time we need. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we need this certainty about the future of the garden at uh, Blue Gum Reserve. Good, uh, thank you, Greg. All right, thank, we'll, you. thank you for your submission. Uh, we'll move on to the Madam next. Chairman, am I allowed to ask a question of oh. Point of Greg? clarification, Councillor Bauer, please. Yeah. A point of clarification to Greg or Jeff, the Blue Grammar Reserve, is that the final place you want for the the, the, the nursery part? Yes, perhaps I could I respond to that. We've been through a process of looking at a number of sites over the last year or more with, uh, with council staff, and we've settled on Blue Gum Reserve as the preferred site, and that's agreed by council staff uh, and Pickle, uh, but council staff have advised that they need to go through a process of amending the blue government's their past that to council for approval uh, by August before council can formally okay our move to blue gum reserve. Okay. Thank you for Thank the you. clarification. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your submission. We'll move on to the next submitter now, which is uh, uh, Greg Woods Wood from the San Remo Bowling Club. Greg, are you there? Uh, is Greg there? Uh, sorry, I just lost you all for a minute. There, can you see me? Yes, I can. Thank Lovely. you, Greg. Welcome. Good. Thank you, Councillor. You can uh, go five minutes to present your thank submission. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Serb, and thank you very much all the councillors that are here for listening to our submissions today. I'm representing the San Remo Bowls Club and um, just a, a little bit of a history here. We were issued with a certificate of occupancy of the new dining room in 1992. It is in its former life, it was the staff canteen from Phillips Australia and it's been standing as a building at various sites for quite some years. Now the sea air and time has given rise to uh, rotting timber window frames along the length of this dining room. The club has commissioned um, onshore designs to draw up plans to present to local builders for quotations with the aim to replace the windows. We've done an, we're doing an asbestos audit and that's um, all the necessary precautions that need to be undertaken if we are to replace these windows will be sorted out in due course. Now while sitting at the dining tables currently we would at the moment we can't see 
out onto the green uh, of people playing bowls. And so what we were wanting to do is to be able to increase the length of those windows so that they are now start, they, they start at the dining table height and extend to the ceiling. We're looking to replace the existing windows with four 1.9 meter wide by 2.2 meter high windows. And between those, we're looking at putting some doors, sliding doors, three of those 1.2 meters wide from 2.2 meters high. Now, from the doors, we would like to extend the experience to the outdoors. So we're looking at constructing a covered deck to extend 1.8 metres from the dining room to the paved footpath alongside the green. We're going to also include or planning to put a concrete ramp, which includes, which is on the western end of the deck, for wheelchair access. We have emails of support from the local CFA who hold their annual awards night and compete in the hotly contested regional CFA members bowling competition. We've also got a very nice letter from the Griffiths Point Lodge who sent an email of support applauding the initiative, in particular, the covered decking. This provides shade to the residents, but also to all those people who are visiting and viewing the games on the green. Through the year, there are many events that are booked by members of the community. There are birthdays, corporate bowls, competitions with local businesses. And uh, we also have many pennant players come in competitions. And we also use it for birthdays, local business meetings, and, some, and wakes have been held there. Also, social nights, Friday night social nights, we also have in the past had meals there for the local community to come and enjoy a social, social outing for some of those people who don't perhaps get out as much as they would like. There are many people and groups who use the club through the year and at our recent AGM, the club members voted in support of the project and have agreed to contribute $30,000 from the club funds. I'm currently preparing a report to the Bendigo Bank to propose and propose to apply for a community grant that is on offer from the bank. I would imagine that that amount at this stage could be $5,000. The total cost of the works is only estimated, but we have had a few quotes in the past, but we're estimating it to be to about $70,000. So therefore, the club is seeking the assistance from the Shire Council to provide $40,000 towards this project. The windows in the dining room are in a state of urgent repair and with the shared funding for this project, the dining room will be available to the San Remo community, certainly for another 30 years. So that's my submission. I hope that we can be met, we can, we can supply to you the plans that are necessary because we're getting those drawn up now. And I would love <coughs> to be able to come and present those to you at another time if needs be. But thank you all for your um, allowing me to talk today. And um, I'm hopeful that uh, everyone else has a good opportunity to discuss their plans as well. Thank you very much. Good, thank you, Greg. That was uh, a, a great submission. So uh, we thank you for your submission and we'll move on to the next one, which is uh, John Stewart for uh, Coronella Resident Rate Pay Group and I, uh, the nominated speaker is Peter Tate. So welcome, Peter and, and John. Um, you've got five minutes to present your submission to the councillors. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the other councillors who have their time to have a listen to what we've got to say. I've actually been able to um, lock John down for five minutes to complete what he started off to do. So I'll get it over to John and let him uh, the presentation forward. Thank you, Madam Chair and, uh, and councillors. Uh, and great to see our other uh, ward councillors present as well. Uh, I'll keep this short and simple. Coronella is in desperate need of some additional infrastructure in the, in the form of um, firm, stable walking paths on two main thoroughfares. We have the situation in the main street of Coronella, uh, which, I, which, which is really terrible, where we have um, a footpath, concrete footpath that ends in no man's land. 
effectively. Uh, so it travels most of the uh, the length of the main street and then ends in a grassed verge uh, where people uh, have to then move onto the main street, Smythe Street, uh, and uh, and walk down the roadway to get to um, one of the main features of the town, which is the uh, uh, the boat launching facility and the the uh, rotunda and barbecue areas, etc. Uh, on the other side of uh, of the uh, Coronado Peninsula, we have the Esplanade, which is a, a very much a scenic route. There is no footpath. There is a grassed verge on one side. There is a grassed verge with a very steep slope on the other side. So any person with a walking disability or mobility <coughs> disability. Uh, effect is in effect is extremely challenged. Added to this, we have um, in summer, and this is a result of the uh, the upgrade to the boat ramp, which has now made Coronella a could I say a boating and uh, marine recreational hub for uh, for this area and uh, and West Gippsland generally. We have a very very significantly increased level of uh, vehicle vehicular traffic that uh, moves down Smythe Street or the Esplanade with boats and boat trailers attached. Um, it must be something about fishing, but everyone who has a boat must uh, travel at exactly 60 kilometres an hour to get to the fish that uh, will be gone if they don't uh, get their boat launched in 37 seconds. So <clears throat> people don't travel slowly with boats. People who are pedestrians have a on the roadway are naturally slow. It defies logic in this day and age to be in a situation of a town that is growing, and it's growing in... Uh, aged population as well as growing in young families where people are forced to walk on the roadway amidst the traffic to get to some of the facilities in the town. We're asking for something very simple. Uh, the extension of one footpath uh, by about 190 metres, the addition of a footpath down Peter Street, which Clan Surf will know, uh, is from Smythe Street to uh, to the top of the uh, uh, the boat ramp hill or the caravan park, and then another path along uh, the, the uh, Esplanade from Hamilton Street through to, again, through to the Rotunda or Peter Street. Very simple things to put in place. Council regularly puts uh, a number of footpaths in place each year. Uh, the other thing we'd like to see is half a dozen seats, uh, as in normal bench seats, provided because our age population, to be quite frank, can't walk from one end of the town to the other and sit down because there's nowhere to sit down. Uh, apart from the uh, apart from Hughes Reserve, which is approximately a kilometre uh, from the uh, from the caravan park at the other end, so we've done some costings uh, on the basis of, uh, of known uh, known uh, dollar cost to do these works, and it comes out in total at just over two hundred thousand dollars. Now, I will say that estimate is fairly fat, uh, as we say in the industry, because uh, there's a number of um, uh, things that need to be taken into consideration. Uh, as in removal of grass and uh, putting in base for concrete uh, uh, and actually putting the concrete in place, pram crossings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <coughs> no doubt we'll have its own economies of scale there, so we think that could probably be reduced by something in the vicinity of 25% in total. Um, we understand that council uh, will not, cannot uh, and won't put footpaths on every street in Coronella. That's a given. What we're asking for is very simply that people, particularly those with uh, disabilities in terms of mobility, can actually traverse from one end of the town to the other uh, free of need to move in a trafficked environment. I will say that um, uh, in the weekend just gone, I've witnessed people on crutches uh, walking around parked cars on Smythe Street down towards uh, Peter Street. Surely that's not acceptable in 2021. Something has to be done. Some money has to be expended in this regard. Uh, you know, we're happy to work with council, and maybe this is a staged thing. Uh, that's entirely acceptable, but we at least need a commencement from council to do something in the coming financial year, hence our detailed submission. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Peter and John, for your submission. And uh, the councillors have read uh, all the submissions, so... Um, we thank you for coming today and thank you. Uh, back to we'll move on to the next submission, which is uh, caller one, Phil Wright. You there? Uh, yes, Claire. Yeah? Uh, Claire, can you receive my audio? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, thank you. Go ahead, yep, Phil. Um, yep. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank um, Leanne and the other staff involved in this. Um, I am in Kempsey Library at the moment, 
heading south from a holiday in northern New South. Um, very unusual, but they've been very helpful, so it's great. Um, so the the position that I'm presenting today is identical to the one I presented 12 months ago. Basically, what it's saying is what we have to do is look at the economic and environmental advantage of having world-renowned pathway network on Phillip Island. Um, at, at when I last presented, COVID wasn't to be thought that it was going to have the impact that it has now. And Nature Park are really struggling. We, the future economy of Phillip Island is looking, in the short term at least, maybe even longer, no international visitors. And so we have to build a, a duplicate system. And it's about paths. All, all the documents clear that you were involved in when I was on council with you, the visitor economy strategy is the main one, which the environment is the economy. People want to escape Melbourne. Uh, the West Coast is totally overdeveloped. Peninsula can't park a car. And the prom is great, but you've got to travel so far. The opportunity for us at the moment with loans so low is, is very, very strong. And the, the, the point that I'm, I'm really presenting is we have the reports. They're everywhere. The pits, visitor economy strategy, natural environment strategy, biolinks, rural land use strategy, aspirational paths. It's all done. So let's pick off some very important paths and deliver. And the, the main one, of course, is Woolamai, Cape Woolamai. It's the only surfing reserve of national significance in Victoria. You can't walk in there. Mums with prams and kids with surfboards can't get there. All the path is totally on Crown land, doesn't involve any private property. And we, we've already got a draft of it. It's the Nature Park KAP um, key area plan shows exactly what should happen. So then that leads into something else, Claire, is yeah. the second action in the visitor economy strategy is to develop an accord between Council Nature Park, DPI, Destination Phillip Island, and it hasn't been done. That, that We passed that in, tw in 2016. It hasn't been done. So you've got all these organisations off doing different things. We have to get together like that was what the whole strategy was about. Let's work together, identify actions need to be done. So the first one is Woolamai. The second one is the Esplanade at Surf Beach. Council is currently drafting up a private street special charge scheme for the uh, surf beach in Sunderland Bay. Well, who's going to pay on the south side when we have this beautiful path that goes for five kilometres with world best viewing? We haven't even looked at that. The time now is to go out and borrow money off, off um, by the state government. Where I've just been holidaying is a place called Ballingen, and I went to their show office yesterday and asked them what they were doing. They've developed the Pedestrian Access Mobility Plan. They're funding that with grants. Maybe it's grants is what we need. So then that leads into what happened in 1975. There was a, a, a bill that went to Parliament, state parliaments, called Phillip Island Conservation Development Bill, which the whole point about it was to get some user pays. People from Melbourne would love to pay to get value. At the moment, there's no link pathways anywhere. There's Pyramid Rock through to Barry's Beach, but there's nothing. There's no significance. We want people with holiday houses to come down, park their car on Friday night, don't even hop in their car till Sunday because we've got world's best link pathways. So what my response from council last year when I'd said the same thing was that land on the coast is very expensive. Well, that's untrue. Re re residential land on the coast is very expensive, but not rural land. And what we've got to do is go and work. Council's done a great job with the Carnival site and the Gap Road site. What we've got to do is go and negotiate with private property owners along the coast and buy a five-metre strip. I'm estimating from Gap Road, which is a racetrack to, serve to, to Sunland Bay, only going to cost 60 grand for a world's best pathway. Okay, I don't know if I said too much, Claire, but that's... No, that's fine, Phil. You're right on time. So thank you. Thank you for your submission. Okay, cheers. Enjoy your trip. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to the next submitter, which is, who is uh, Phil uh, Burke from the Phillip Island Football Netball Club. Phil, are you there? Yep, I'm here. I'll just turn myself on. 
so you should be able to hear me and see me. Yes, I can hear you and see you. Thank you, Phil. Welcome. You've got five minutes Thank to you, put Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I'll be pretty brief, I think. Um, most of you are aware Phillip Island Footy Netball Club is a fairly large club in the West Gippsland area. We service around 2,200 people directly through uh, players, netballers, parents, etc., uh, and numerous other local residents. We're also the largest uh, odd kick centre in the whole of Western Gippsland, much bigger than any other uh, Oz Kick Centre. We have around 200 kids running around on a Friday night. So the, the club is in a growth a growth stage and uh, is expected to continue for some time. Um, one of the proposals that uh, we considered at the start of this year was looking at how we could reduce our greenhouse gas footprint uh, and our uh, use of electricity. Uh, we identified an opportunity to install solar power systems onto our facility which would significantly reduce over a period of time our um, our expenditure on uh, ex electricity from our club rooms, which are uh, commercially, uh, so there's commercial kitchens and, and so on that runs during the day that choose a lot of power. So even though we're predominantly, a, 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 I guess you would say, a nighttime activity except for weekends, um, we have a large electricity cost running, which is um, obviously currently generating um, all sorts of potential uh, greenhouse gases and so on. Um, the proposal we put together was we sought, uh, sought costs from local suppliers, settled on one of our local uh, suppliers who estimated the cost at around 15000 for installation of solar to our operation and the payback periods were probably were certainly over two or three years. Um, so it's a significant reduction potentially to our electricity costs. It would certainly reduce our greenhouse gas footprint and uh, transmit and emissions. Um, there's certainly also an opportunity to contribute power supplies back into the electricity grid locally, and it certainly aligns with Council's overall climate plan. Um, we also have considered whether we could install batteries, and at this point we haven't considered batteries, but the potential system that we are looking at would would potentially support batteries either locally installed or as we're starting to see more and more of uh, community-based battery facilities. So um, that's really what we're talking about. Uh, the total project cost is $15,000. We put in a community grants application uh, for around 10 of that. So we believe we can cover uh, the 5000 on top of the, the, the 10 that we submit, uh, submit the grant for. So we're looking for council to potentially support that process. Um, so it's as simple as that. It's an opportunity for us to uh, to get on the front foot with our solar and uh, sorry, our greenhouse gas emissions and and do something about reducing our uh, significant electricity costs for the club. So that's probably all I've got to say. Uh, yep, sorry. Thank you, uh, Councillor Holstead. A point of clarification. Thank you, Councillor LeServe. Um, I just had a question, Mr Burke, whether the uh, club has had a look into any federal or state rebates that might be available for solar panels. I know that they often run programs. I'm not, a, not um, a, a sure of whether they're running any at the moment, but has the club investigated that option? Yeah, the actual cost is inclusive of those sorts of rebates. So the, 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 the cost of the Equipment is significantly higher than 15, but that's a net cost after taking into account all of those um, those opportunities that are currently there. Um, and and our supplier, our suggested supplier, which is a, a cows based one, had already done all that research. So that was as of J uh, January. Things are moving all the time, but um, yeah, we've taken that into account. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you, Phil, for your submission. Thank well, you. Like to, it's okay. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the submitters and uh, make it uh, advice that this meeting, um, apart from the fact that it was recorded, will be made publicly available um, after the meeting in the council website. So, if anybody would like to go to that, that, that would be great. So, uh, I'll close the meeting. Uh, thank you for attending.